Okay, we're just going. All right, good morning, everybody. We'll just wait a moment or two whilst people join the um, the webinar. Give it a, a few seconds. Right, we'll give it till one and a minute, one minute and a few more seconds past ten before we before we start. Okay, I think let's get going. So good morning. My name is Brendan Geraghty. I'm the Chief Exec of the Association for Rental Living. And today we're presenting something which is going to be, I suspect, will be an increasingly important element of the built to rent journey. And that is to be, to, to be or not to be a B Corp organization. Now, we will, we have assembled a, a, a panel um, led by um, Andy Marshall, who will discuss B Corp and, and, and let you know what it what what it's about and how 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 challenging it is to to become B Corp and what it really represents is this, is a significant shift in culture about the way one goes about one's business. But I suppose the cynics in the room will say, well, is it just another badge? Do I just have to go and buy another expensive badge, stick it on my website, and that'll probably be enough? Or is it really a profoundly different thing that forces us to make changes that are often challenging, difficult, and potentially even expensive? That's not for me to answer, that's for the for the panel to answer. So without any further ado, I will hand you over to Andy who will introduce the panel. Please remember there is a Q&A function that you can put your, your, your questions in and Andy will do his best to pick them all up through the course of the morning's um, presentation. Andy, over to you. Thank you, Brendan. Okay, so I'm Andy from Harrison Brands. We've been B Corp um, since March last year. So it's been quite a while. What I'd like to do is uh, hand over to each of the people on the panel to introduce themselves and state where they are on their B Corp journey. So I'm going to do it alphabetically so that everybody will know who's next, starting off with Brent. Thank you, Andy. So I'm Brent Stjanovic. I'm a co-founder and director at Verve Life. We are a nationwide third-party operator and consultant of built-to-rent, co-living and single-family rental communities across the UK. On the B Corp front, we were a pending B Corp. Um, a B Corp certification was something we always knew we wanted to attain when we set the business up three and a half years ago. Um, at the moment, we're in the interstitial phase between between being a pending B Corp and a fully certified B Corp. So like many, uh, many people, perhaps in the audience, um, uh, our application is currently with the B Lab team awaiting, awaiting audit and evaluation. Hi, um, my name is Chris. I'm the Group Projects Director at Centric. Uh, similar to Brent, we are a BTR operator. Um, we also work very heavily in the block management and asset management space. Um, and again, similar to Verbalife, we are currently B Corp pending. Hi, everyone. My name is Katie Cairns. I am Associate and Passive House Designer at Asale Architecture. Uh, we do uh, a lot of uh, build to rent and co-living schemes and a lot, a lot of other sectors as well in the residential market. Uh, we have um, very recently become B Corp certified, um, certifying in April, so just under three months now. And I was on the core team who helped to, to gain that certification. Just, just trying to work my way through the alphabet. Shall I go next, Andy? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, everybody. My name's Steph Wright, uh, and I'm the chairman of a group of companies called the Gusto Group. Uh, we got our B Corp certification in January of this year. Uh, we're quite a complex group of companies. Uh, we cover 
uh, we have a construction company we have a architect practice we have a we are developers uh, of uh, residential housing developers we've been building low energy homes for the past 25 years so we've been very much uh, involved in the whole sustainability sector for a long period of time uh, and we also have a manufacturing business, which is a rotational moulding company in the plastic sector. So I would say that we're not your typical uh, B Corp type of business uh, in terms of the sectors that, that we're involved in. Uh, but we have the B Corp principles running through the core of our company. Excellent. Thanks, Steph. Um, so I'll roll on to the first question, really, which is the big why you know what motivated your company to pursue b corp certification in the first place and i'd like to address this to steph first is it worth it it's a painful process so uh and it's a long process it took us about two and a half years from first uh applying for b corp uh, to actually get the accreditation uh because of the sectors that we're involved with uh, B-Lab uh, decided that they needed to do uh, a much more in-depth audit of our sectors because I don't think they'd accredited companies that were uh, in, in the construction and manufacturing sectors that we're involved in. So uh, I think that's probably why ours took longer. Uh, it, uh, it does mean you've got to make lots of changes within your company. But if you the, the starting point is you have to have a mindset uh, of understanding sustainability, uh, understanding the benefits of it to your company, and also understanding the business opportunities that will come from it. If you don't see any business opportunities through it, uh, then it's very difficult to uh, bring everybody within your company on that journey with you, uh, because it has to have a, a, a business benefit uh, alongside all the other uh, advantages which I think it does give your company and, I, and I'll talk more about those in, uh, as, as the uh, webinar uh, progresses. Excellent thanks Steph. I'd just like to address this to Katie as well particularly with the whole thing about you know was it the culture the shifting culture that you wanted within a cell or was it also the the need for investment as well you know so what what was the real reason? Um, so for us, I think we actually felt as a company that we aligned with a lot of the B Corp principles um, and we have done sort of from the outset of the company 30 years ago. Uh, so it is, it's obviously the sustainability side of things, but it covers other things like looking after your staff, which we've always been very, very um, keen to do and um, other sort of ethical principles as well. Uh, we've often given back to our communities through a lot of charitable events. And I think the, the, the main reason for us why B Corp was such a great um, sort of certification process to go down is that it was this kind of umbrella across all of these elements. Um, it's not just a kind of a tick box of sustainability. It's not just a tick box of staff. So previously we were, for example, investors in people, but we felt that, um, you know, B Corp was much broader um, than than that, and it's and it's got such global recognition now that it's it's a kind of stamp that will make you stand out from the crowd. And for um, you know, we've had challenging times recently with you know economic situation, and you know, for us to be able to have that to have the edge against our competitors to be able to win work was also one of the kind of main driving factors for us. Excellent. Thank you. Well, I think that's interesting what you were saying about the box ticking thing. Um, is it just a box ticking exercise or is there a lot more to it? And I'd like Chris to uh, answer that. Um, now, bear in mind that we have chosen to, to take the leap and we are being book pending. Um, my honest answer is at the moment, yes, I think it is a bit of a tick box exercise. Um, but I think a common theme that will come throughout this webinar is perception. And outside of companies or people that really understand what people is, there is a misconception and it is seen as that tick box. The focus is always on the E in ESG and it's a bit like, oh, look, they recycle, that's nice. Um, but it, it is more than that, it's more than a badge. We, we see it as a, as a commitment um, to 
to up our standards, to accept that we have as a company a social responsibility. Um, and as Katie said, it, it's more than just the, the environmental side, it's it's basic internal policies about looking after your staff. And it's a lot of things that a lot of companies do already without even realizing that that plays quite a big part of it. Um, so yes, currently I think it is a tick box exercise, um, but I think it comes back to those that know exactly what it is, that's perception. And there needs to be a shift there because everyone's dipping their toe in thinking, oh, ESG is important, but we want someone else to take that leap first. And until somebody does, until there's a big shift, we're, we're still going to have that kind of gray area of should we, shouldn't we. Yeah, I think a lot of people are, are finding that problem. And, you know, it's interesting how B Corp masks itself as an ESG platform as well you know, because yeah. it's embedded within that, but I think also a lot more. Um, mm -hmm. But with the the badge that there is, this B with a circle that you can put on all your marketing material, Bren, I'll turn to you and say, is it recognized by people? And what are the challenges with it? You know, do people challenge you on it? So, so, I, so I think B Corp for us um, is really the gold standard of of what you might call in twenty twenty four stakeholder capitalism, right? Um, and, and it has been for a while. And I think I think more widely, what's interesting to, to me uh, about B Corp is in a world where ESG focused, stakeholder focused accreditations, certifications, quote unquote badges are proliferating at a rate of knots. B Corp has not only held its salience; it's it's going from strength to strength. Um, sector neutral as well, which is really interesting. You're a brand guy, Andy. I think I think in the context of brand building, a lot to learn from from what the B Corp team have uh, have done with their brand and, and how they've grown it. So I think that's the first thing I'd say. In in terms of our approach to to, to the B Corp process, the B Corp certification, really, I think for me there are three clear sides of of the B Corp prism, in no particular order. You've got the, the investor or the client side, and, and again, we're we're a third party operator. So obviously, our investors, our clients, are typically you know banks, institutional investors, investment managers, private equity outfits, so on and so forth. So there's, there's that side. There's the the internal bit as well. So so how do you leverage B Corp as a tool to employ the best talent, but also retain them. I'm not going out on a limb here. It's the same for all operators. Operational labor markets at the moment are, are what you might call tricky. So I think as a, as a tool for employee engagement and retention, B Corp, it's a really rich vein. Um, and then there's the occupational market. On the investor side of things, as an operator, becoming a B Corp certified business uh, will will is good for business. It will help you win business. Um, investors in my experience really really resonate with it um obviously investors now have uh, any good investor worth their salt will have a, a a really really well formed robust comprehensive esg strategy you know if they work with an operator which is a b corp pending they get to say that their asset is is managed and operated as a b corp asset which which i think again has real benefits for them, not just in terms of perception, but also in terms of their ESG reporting and and the value add that a good operator can can deliver beyond NOI. Right, um, as as an internal piece, um, it, it's a re really interesting patch for for, for operators and and for any business, I suppose, that, that becomes B Corp because you can start briefing out and giving your people really interesting portfolios, really interesting um, uh, projects which may fall out of the day-to-day -day of what they do really really important for self-development really important for people keeping people retained so i think i think that's that's you know a, a great bonus for a business like ours as well becoming a b corp Occu occupationally i'm not really seeing at the moment based on based on our insights uh, a, a demand from the occupational market to live in a b corp certified asset or live in an asset which is operated by a b corp certified certified organization do i expect that to change via osmosis given societal shifts over time absolutely yes i do i think for operators yeah. occupationally becoming b corp is about planting a seed for the future I think it's quite notable, isn't it, that just last week, indicatively of this, perhaps the Green Party returned their, their their best result ever at the general election, quadrupling the number of uh, the, the the number of uh, the number of MPs to to, to four. Um, notwithstanding, of course, you know the fact that Labour are in now, and we're all very excited about their green agenda and and you know some of the some of the noises we're making around house building, which is great for all, all concerned here, I would imagine. Um, so so I think I think occupationally, it's about planting a seed for the future. 
when it comes to the investor and the client side um, of our B Corp status, it's very much here and now. So when you talk about the how sort of it's recognized by all parties and maybe there's within consumer behavior or tenant behavior, you know, it's a bit slow to pick up. I'd like to ask Steph particularly, given the fact that there's 150 people working in his organization, are all 150 people behind this B Corp movement or is it led by the leadership team and some of some of the staff just don't get it? You know, what's the situation? Yeah, uh, absolutely it needs to be led by the leadership team, it needs to be led. Uh, and, and my company has been led by me. I started the company uh, 40 years ago and uh, I've always gone down a route of innovation and sustainability and as i've learned more uh you know i've developed my ideas and then you try to sort of push those ideas down uh, with, within your company i think that, that i had a realization that uh that, that was parts of the business that didn't get it at all uh, and when we started to do the B Corp accreditation process and needed to pull together all the data and everything that we needed to pull together to uh, to tick the boxes uh, then that meant that a lot more people within the organization were becoming aware of what we were doing why we were doing it actually looking at the community interaction we had we, we've got our Augusto community fund we give uh, we've given over a hundred thousand to local community projects through the community fund so there's aspects of what we do that people really do get uh, there's other aspects and I'm sure there's quite a few people in my organization will have put their box in uh, Nigel Farage's uh, tick box uh, last Thursday uh, and and it's up you, you know if you we've got 150 staff and you're going to have people that have got all sorts of different views and ideas on uh, how, how the world should be run but generally people are very focused on wanting their place of work to be a place that looks after the people that work for the company uh, and they they want us to deliver a, a really good level of customer service and want us to do the right thing by the community and the environment in in, in the way that we go about our business so you know it depends how you talk to people uh if it's if it seemed to be political then people have all sorts of different political viewpoints uh if you talk about the actual benefits and outcomes of having a business that is focused on people planet and profits then people get it uh, and it, what it also does, it's taken us down a journey of me thinking, well, how do I uh, transition my business from the current ownership model, which is me owning the company and uh, being the effectively the, the, the shareholder in the business, uh, and we're transitioning the whole business to become employee-owned. Uh, so we've given share options to all our staff, and in three years' time, uh, our whole business will be owned by an employee ownership trust. And our staff will benefit uh, from the growth and the value of the business uh, when it transitions to be an employee ownership trust. So it's about trying to align everybody's uh, interests. And I think a lot of employees are, are very disconnected from the companies they work for. Uh, they, they don't feel that they're a stakeholder in those businesses. Uh, they don't get value from the work they do for the companies, apart from picking up a, a paycheck at the end of the week. Uh, and so, you know, w one of the things that's wrong with our economy is we, we're, uh, we're, we're very unproductive economy. We, we need to be, our productivity levels need to rise. And I think that B Corp and that mindset uh, and getting people far better engaged and ultimately, if you go down the employee ownership route, that's almost the the gold standard of, uh, of proper employee, you know, uh, well, pe people being fully engaged with their company uh, is going to make businesses more uh, productive and, and, and make people feel better about the companies they work for. I can agree with you more, Steph. Um, we became uh, an EOT, Employee Ownership Trust, about uh, over five years ago now. And wow. the the impact that we've seen on staff being feeling like they're more engaged has been yeah really successful. Um, we have... Uh, 
quarterly um, sort of staff forums where people can come and um, bring topics of discussion with them. And yeah, people definitely do feel like they have much more of a say in the business. We also um, have a, a business plan which gets updated every five years. And so when that was updated a couple of years ago, there was a number of different sessions with staff members so that they could actually give their feedback and their their opinions about what how they felt the business plan um, should be written and you know what sort of changes they wanted to see coming into it and that was I think a fantastic um, sort of opportunity for us to to really utilize the the employee ownership trust kind of model um, and that, that's actually read, fed so well into B Corp as well because so many of those things are, are aligned um, and yeah I think you know in today's um, sort of market you want to be attracting the best staff out there and I think that although you, you know you say it's not going to necessarily appeal to absolutely everyone I think that staff these days do care about well-being they do care about the diversity and inclusion and equality of a company they do care about flexibility and um, being looked after with additional benefits and I think that yeah with B Corp it's not just about kind of gaining that stamp in the first place but it's then about the recertification process as well which, which is then going to drive us to continually improve and continually look at our internal policies and say how can we do this better um, so yeah I think it's attractive in that sense. Yeah it's, a, well, it's an external force that uh, keeps working helps you work on your business I think that's um, you know we all work very hard within our businesses uh, and I think the, the the whole B Corp certification process and recertification process helps you work on the business, definitely, uh, which is important important for all business growth. Yeah. Oh well, we'll have to uh, uh, we'll have to start doing a bit of business together then, Katie. Because <laughs> uh, just just on that before we move on, because it, it is about aligning your business with other pe other companies that have got similar values. Absolutely. And, and, I, th and I think that needs to be understood by anybody that's thinking about going through the pain of B Corp certification, because uh, I, I'll give you a quick example. I, when we started to go down the employee ownership route, uh, I put the word out there and, and I ended up having a meeting with the president of John Lewis Partnership. I had the head of, uh, of, uh, um, of uh, development, of uh, uh, property development uh, from John Lewis Partnership came over had a full day over with me. I said, I'll tell you about property development and what we've done in terms of sustainability and property development. And if you tell me about uh, all the challenges of employee ownership. Uh, so I had a really good session with John Lewis Partnership. And John Lewis Partnership are wanting to build 10,000 homes over the next 10 years, uh, a lot of which are going to be built to rent. Uh, so you can understand that an organisation like that is going to look at its supply chain and think, well, actually, I really want to align myself with another employee-owned business or a B Corp or businesses that align with our uh, ethos. Again, I've got a meeting in a couple of weeks' time with the Lincolnshire Co-op. Uh, Lincolnshire Co-op want to do more uh, build to rent. Uh, so I think, and, and they want to work with us because of the ethos of our business. So I think the, the compelling business uh, opportunities that come from it are important for people to understand if they're going to go through the pain of certification. I think that's definitely the case. And I think what's been highlighted recently with both yourself, Steph, and Katie, who have both B Corp certified, that's been noticeable to me, is it goes much beyond getting the badge. It's a cultural thing. It's the way you see the business moving on in the future. It's it's a way to act. And you must act upon these things. It's not enough just to get the certification. There is a, a constant endeavor to be better all the time, you know, to get better um, scores in the impact assessment, uh, for example. But I'd like to address it back to the impact assessment. And Chris, who's recently filled in the impact assessment, and it's currently with B Lab pending, I'd be interested to know what particular challenges were in the impact assessment that made you really focus on changing the business in a way that could have been very challenging. Um, I mean, it, it's come up already, but there's no hiding behind the fact that the assessment itself is very arduous. 
and it really does make you think about every element of your business in a, in a very unique way. Um, I think the biggest challenge is that every company is set up slightly differently. So there isn't a one size fits all for, for completing the assessment. Uh, we actually engaged for that for that end um, with the consultants um, to, to help guide us um, and make sure that we we're on the right track. Because like with many people on this webinar, I'm sure this was all very new to us. Um, and although we, we knew that we wanted to commit to this next step um, in kind of Centric's journey, we we it was it was all brand new information and, and we didn't want to go down down the wrong route. Um, I think we were lucky in a certain respect that a lot of the the governance um, and, the, and the social side of the, the assessment we were already doing to a certain extent without even realizing. Um, we're partnered with charities, we've got some very robust policies surrounding our staff and keeping staff over. Um, we were very kind of fresh, I would say, on the more environmental side. Um, you know, we we'd never even considered how we would monitor or measure our carbon footprint, for example. Um, and that's not something you can just kind of put your finger in the air and decide, it's a very complex process. Um, and that's where each company really needs to decide on where they can make the biggest impact and where therefore they need to put that investment. Um, so as I said, from, from us personally, our investment is very much going on that side of things because the, the other side, we, we've kind of got in-house and we know that we're doing the right things, we're trying to do the right things, and it was more kind of tweaks and adjustments in terms of policies and processes, um, whereas the environmental thing, we, it was literally a, a starting from scratch from everything. And so that's where we chose to throw a lot of our, our resource and investment. Um, again, the common thing, it's not easy. It is a long-winded process. And what I've experienced so far with the the B lab side of things is that they're very good. They will ask questions and kind of guide you in terms of did you mean to answer it like this or actually is it like this? Um, I'm sure similar to again most people on the call, our company structure is quite complex and it's uh, how far down the rabbit hole do you go? Um, and again, they will help guide on that. Um, and, and point in the right direction. Um, so that's been really positive so far. Excellent. Well, I see that somebody in the question, in the Q&A part has said, what's the hardest parts of the process of the B Corp, which we've seen? But, you know, maybe Brent, if you could answer, um, did you get an external consultant or do it yourself? I mean, do you need help from outside to, to do this? I think it all depends on on where your business is in its life cycle, what your business is, is set up to to do, right? Um, so 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 just to illustrate that, um, and to answer your question more more directly, I suppose, Andy, we, we were a bit more sort of blue collar about it. We 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 were DIY. We we did it ourselves, but I actually think in a lot of respects, because we're able to bake in the broad direction of travel before we'd even set the company up in terms of in terms of governance the sort of business we wanted to become what was important to us and how is that going to envision its way through our operating platform because we did that work before we launched the business it, it's probably fair to say almost easier than what well, will be easier I, I would i would posit than than you know a, a multinational prop co for example turning the ship around collating all of the information on an organizational level across multiple offices, multiple territories, multiple, multiple business lines, and then submitting an impact assessment. So, so I think, I think I'd say that we did it ourselves, but we were in, we we're in a position to do it ourselves as we grow, obviously attaining the certification is one thing, but then it's not like anything worth having, I suppose you, you have to maintain it, water it, it's iterative. Um, so, you know, B Corp now uh, has a home in our business that there's someone with custody of that remit and it's their job to what you might call conduct the orchestra. So make sure that, you know, those tenets and that governance and that approach, the North Star, which is which is B Corp, is, 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 is percolated right the way for our business. Um, so, so I think again, it, it, it sort of it, it sort of depends. That the trickiest part for us as a third party operator, 
um, because we'd done that work around governance up front, was probably supply chain. Probably supply chain. I mean, Chris's business will be the same. Many businesses will be the same. Complex supply chains. Going back to your supply chain and 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 and, and encouraging and cajoling them to provide you with the information you need as as an operator to then you know not just not just create and develop your B lab assessment but also get the right get the right scores um, is is an endeavour. Um, it, it is an endeavour, and I think as you know, Chris has said. And as Steph has said very eloquently, you know, it, what that does, that process, is it really shines a light on who you're working with and why you're working with them, right? Um, and, and decisions inevitably have to be made around that in terms of who, who you're entering into commercial relationships with. Yeah, and I think the, the other thing about B Corp that I think is quite interesting is it, it does provide a sense of community. B Corps want to work together. So addressing this thing is, is it expensive to do? I think, yes, in time, it definitely is. Do you need external help? There's a lot of help out there that from other B Corps that they're prepared to give you. And B Lab themselves are really helpful too. So it doesn't have to cost you a lot of money. It can cost you a bit of time. Um, I think addressing this whole thing about the size of business, is it easy for big companies or small companies? What, what's the advantages, disadvantages of the size of the company? Um, yeah, maybe it would be quite good if Steph answered that, you know, because not a small company, 150, you know, was it was it easy? It, 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 I, I, going back to what Brent said, if, if you're setting your business up from the start, you know, what that is the perfect time uh, to be able to use the B Corp model to structure your business. And actually, when you think about it, with, without anything like B Corp out there, how do people really uh, set up their businesses uh, to start with? There's, there's, uh, it, it, as you were talking, Brent, I was thinking, well, you know, when I started my business off, you just sort of made stuff up as you went along. Uh, there was no model that I could sort of plug into and think, actually, this is a great way to set your business up. This this uh, forces me to look at the whole structure of the business across across everything we're going to do and, and, and uh, to, to set that uh as a foundation to grow from uh so you know i think to anybody who's at that stage that early stage to get b corp um uh pending uh is absolutely the right time to do it when you are a long established business as we are uh then there'll be parts of the company that no doubt very quickly align with b corp because that's probably why you're thinking about doing it because you're already on the same wavelength as B Corp uh, on a few of the different uh, sort of uh, elements of B Corp. Uh, but there'll be other elements that you're not that aligned on it and you need to do a lot of work. And I think it's right around those parts that it is difficult. So our supply chain uh, in, in the construction sector, unfortunately, uh, our supply chain is a pretty dirty supply chain uh, in terms of the types of products and materials that we use. It's uh, uh, we, we're very dependent on the fossil fuel industry for a lot of the competitive products that you use in house building. Uh, I, I'm, I'm also an investor in a company called Hemspan uh, that are developing a range of building products made of hemp uh, and natural building products. So there are other supply chains out there that, uh, that at the moment aren't as commercially viable as the, the mainstream supply chains. And that's you know, an issue that we all suffer from. You know, you've got to make your business sustainable. You know, I've I've said over the, many many times over my years in business uh, that you know, without making a profit, you, you're not sustainable. You know, your business is not going to continue to operate. Uh, so, unfortunately, you can't be absolutely perfect on every level uh, in your business. And if you try to be, then is, well, especially in the sectors that I I operate in. Uh, then you're probably not going to have a business. Uh, so it is about compromise, uh, but it's also about pushing and trying to innovate uh, and, and see opportunities. So uh, our manufacturing business, just to give another example of a company that's come on board with us recently since we got our B Corp accreditation, uh, we manufacture all sorts of products. We're rotational molders. Uh, we're the world's biggest manufacturer of sailing dinghies, so I make all the sailing dinghies for RS Sailing. Any of you sailors out there that uh, 
uh, now they are a sailing brand. Uh, we make all our dinghies and uh, we make uh, oil storage tanks, which you might say is not a very uh, green product to make, but uh, uh, it's a product that we make. Uh, and when we became B Corp accredited, uh, we very quickly got a call from Octopus Energy uh, and we're now developing the casings for their new range of uh, air source heat pumps. Uh, so, and you know, and that. Uh, could, could be a very very valuable contract for us uh, and much as we might have landed that job anyway uh, one thing that caught their eye was the fact that we've got the B Corp uh, branding uh, and when, when they saw us so you know it is that there are definitely opportunities that will come from being B Corp and, and it always does feel good to be aligned with companies that feel as if they have the same moral compass as, as your company does and I think I think just just to annotate that, uh, Steph, and if if I may, I think I think it's such a great point, and I think particularly for for the ARL's membership base here and, and perhaps the audience, because you know you, you can see what you might call a category error quite often with this, um, and and so so for a business like ours, that's okay. You might be talking to an investor about an asset, and 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 they're talking about. Um, extracting maximum value from that asset, obviously. So that's about NOI, but that's also about my business's fee position, right? So that's one side of the fence. On the other side of the fence, um, they have perhaps a list of, um, you know, value add requirements um, around around supply chains and around uh, ESG, around reporting. Um, in some cases, as 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 long as the investors aren't. But that's a good thing fundamentally. My point broadly is um, there needs to be an alignment of of expectations and the commercial reality that that any business operates within, right? And and that's different for different businesses. For us, that's about you know having a reasonable conversation with an investor to say we're set up to deliver on your expectations, but ultimately because this is Western capitalism, it still is someone somewhere is going to have to pay for that. And that trickles down the supply chain, right? So, so I think I think again, a great point Steph makes, and and I think it's something we all need to go away and 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 think about in the context of, in the context of progressing, our businesses and stakeholder capitalism and balancing profit with planet and people, definitely. Yeah, I think I think that's really sort of at the, at the, what it's all about, right? But. I just want to go back to filling in the impact assessment in the first place, because there are some things that are slightly controversial about it or can be seen as controversial. For example, when I was filling it in, I wasn't able to get any points for the ownership of the company because it's owned by a white man. You know, it's that simple. If I was a white woman, I would have got points. If I was black, if I was gay, I would have got points. Katie, you've completed the impact assessment and got the certification. Is the impact assessment fair or is it leaning towards more American um, sort of audience or is it trying to push the dial too far? Um, yeah, it's funny what you say about sort of representation and at the top um, architecture has often often been kind of you know, predominantly uh, male driven at the top and predominantly white. Um, but it's it's acknowledged that the industry is changing slowly. Um, that's something that we've realized as a practice that you can't change overnight. You can't just say, right, let's, let's make a, a female, you know, the leader or let's, you know, employ someone who's black. If, if they don't have the right qualifications, you have to, uh, so what we've been doing through our diversity and inclusion group, for example, is trying to work with schools, trying to work with universities to um, help people from more sort of maybe disadvantaged backgrounds or people who maybe haven't gone to university before and sort of promoting the industry to them, you know, construction industry or architecture and, um, you know, trying to build it more from within rather than just necessarily making it a tick box exercise of promoting um, people because they're women or because they're from a ethnic minority background. I think we as a company feel like, you know, promotions have to be um, done based on merits and similarly, you know, recruitment as well. But something we have 
uh, done through, again, our sort of diversity and inclusion policy is um, having blind CVs. So when CVs first come in, they're, you know, all the kind of identifying information is taken off. Therefore, you know, it's it's giving those people um, the, who maybe you would have uh, potentially had uh, unconscious bias about before, previously and um, trying to remove those sorts of things. So it, it's little policies like that that I think do help um, but I, I, I do think the impact assessment is fair. I think uh, we found from a technical point of view that it is quite Americanized. So, for example, with the uh, questions about uh, the environment and sustainable design, um, a lot of it referred to American sustainability targets. So, like, for example, LEED, um, which is not really done that much in the UK. It's much more an international um, target and you know it's very much used in America but obviously in the UK we um, are you know we recognize more things like BRIAM um, and obviously you know all the building regs and, and that side of things so that we had to go back and forth a lot with our B lab um, assessor asking you know sort of whether we could use the British equivalents and it was still a little bit vague so I hope that when they uh, rewrite the certification process that they aren't so sort of heavily focused on that side of things um, with kind of American policy. Um, but yeah, the impact assessment is, it's it's lengthy, it's hard, it makes you assess um, a lot of different aspects of the industry. But I do feel overall that it, it is quite fair. And I, I don't think it necessarily has to push you in a certain direction because there's so many other aspects where you can pick up points you know if you don't have a female leader or you don't have a a huge number of uh people from ethnic minorities yeah i mean just to, to piggyback on that really I, I think you're absolutely right i think at face value it could be seen as a little bit too far in the other direction as you kind of alluded to Andy. but it the focus isn't on making you tick all those boxes it's as a business there's a conscious decision there and you're starting to ask the right questions and if it is an absolutely valid business decision that you know there is a, a middle-aged white male running the business that, that's okay because as, as kate said there's plenty of other areas to kind of get the points but the points the points aren't the point of it it's the fact that as a business you are considering all of these things that we should be considering Yeah, it's quite interesting. Um, there's hundreds of thousands of companies around the world that have started filling in the impact assessment. Uh, and there's only 7,000 B Corps. Mm -hmm. The average score for a UK company is 59. The threshold to get B Corp is 80. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of companies that are filling it out. And it can be a very useful tool to find out more truth about your business should you decide to spend the time to fill it out you know it doesn't necessarily mean that you'll get up to b corp certification but it does tell you some things about your business that's for sure um i think as we move into the future and obviously b corp the impact assessment is going to evolve um brent how do you see this whole thing evolving you know b corp as a brand and what does it mean for the future and what does it mean for the future in britain for the BTR sector? That's quite a big question, Andy, isn't it? Yeah. Which I'll attempt, to, <laughs> attempt to answer. Um, where do I think it's going to go? Where do I think it's going to go? I think, I th what I think is um, B Corp will become a, a hygiene factor, what you might call a hygiene factor for, 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 for many businesses. And I think particularly in our in our world, right? I I, th I think it will because of the way capital's greening. Because of you know, it, again, it, it, in any in any sector, the capital tend to dictate the direction of travel, right? Um, uh, that's the game we're all playing. So, so I, I I I think look, you know, as long as as long as there's a demand there, um, from 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 capital and and big capital owners to to deploy that capital in businesses that are doing the right thing by people and planet, um, then there's always going to be a bright future for B Corp. Um, because as I mentioned, it, it really is the gold standard at the moment. That's not to say that no one's got a crystal ball. That's not to say that in the next year, two years, three years, a, a new entrant into that space will appear um, and build their own brand, um, borrowing a slightly different track, taking some of the audience share and shine off of B Corp. Who knows at the moment, um, B Corp, is that that seal of assurance? I think for for 
for, for investors and, and for capital in, in, in our world. Um, I think beyond that, it becomes about how that plays out how that plays out practically in the world, if you like. Um, and we've sort of touched on this as a collective already. Th there's a lot of work that needs to be done to that impact assessment and what that means going forward for businesses. Because at the moment, it, it, yeah, I mean, we, we've used this phrase, it's Americanized. It is Americanized. Um, it's generic. It's very generic. So it's incumbent upon the applicant to, to drill into that B Corp assessment, that B Lab assessment, the specificity around their sectors and their businesses I, I i don't know enough about where b-lab are with this and what their strategic roadmap is but it wouldn't surprise me if going forward they started to bespoke and 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 and, and tailor applications for individual sectors um th that that would probably on the whole a, a positive move for b corp um and i think i think again occupationally we've all got to keep an eye on that um, it, it will become over time. And I think this will take longer longer than people or businesses might think, like any sort of meaningful change um, across the board, really. I think it will become a driver of preference that the B Corp badge uh, and more broadly, you know, people want, will want to live in, in assets in communities that, that are sustainable, that put community front and centre and, 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 and that do all the things that the B Corp certification um, holds dear. So, so, so I think, I think, I think it's exciting. My advice to anyone in the audience who's weighing up becoming a B Corp would be: it's going to take you a lot of time to fill in that that application. Depending on the size of your business, the monetary costs can be can be lesser or or slightly greater. Um, but it's a real endeavour. It's an investment. But I would say get get in early, or or or, or, or the best time to the best time to start thinking about this. And, and throwing your hat into the ring is is probably now. Yeah, yeah. I'd, um, yeah. I'd, I'd back that. Um, I think there's every, there's every chance that elements of the B Corp certification will be taken out of our hands anyway through legislation and, and targets and goals. Um, and so becoming an early adopter and considering those things now, there's a very good chance it's going to have benefits in the next few years anyway. Yeah, I think that uh, yeah, I think it's been obviously interesting to see the, uh, uh, the the words that are now coming out of our new government and their ambition to build three hundred thousand houses a year. Uh, and and if you look at the, uh, I mean, what a challenge! Uh, it's very very difficult to see how three hundred thousand houses are going to be built and delivered. Uh, but build to rent is going to be a, a massive part of that. Uh, so I think the whole build to rent sector is going to scale up. Uh, and interestingly, we're already talking to our local authority uh, about their pre-qualification process and uh, putting B Corp at the top of that pre-qual process. Uh, so if you think about it, We've now got a government that I think is going to be far more aligned with the uh, the B Corp model than perhaps our previous government was. Uh, and if that is the case, uh, then they will not only want to drive their agenda, like building 300,000 houses a year, uh, but they also are going to want to drive the better business agenda uh, at, at the same time. Uh, so... Uh, if you just follow that logic through uh, and you work out how can a government uh, create better businesses, uh, then the, what, the one powerful motivator they've got is to uh, drive it through their supply chains uh, and therefore putting B Corp at the top of the pre-qualification process uh, within their supply chains uh, is a very, very logical step for them to take. And we're already, I say, talking to our local authority that are wanting to, uh, to, to put that within their QMA process. So uh, I think that it is the right time to be looking at becoming a better business in terms of your model. Uh, I think the B Corp accreditation at the moment is certainly uh, the gold standard. Uh, and I, I do think that the government will uh, introduce incentives uh, for businesses that have gone through the pain and can prove that they've uh, achieved that standard. Uh, and and 
just to finish off on that, when we're looking at our supply chain, uh, cost is a very important element of it, as it should be when in the public sector as well. But if the public sector wants to change the business environment and take people down a path of becoming better businesses, then they're, they're able to and prepared to pay more for those services. So I think there will be a balance, and there already is in quite a lot of tender processes, uh, where there is a weighting towards uh, the type of business that you are, uh, and not just on the uh, bottom line price that you're submitting uh, within a tender package. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think it makes business sense, even though you might think, well, actually running my business as a B Corp is going to uh, incur me more, a few additional costs. Uh, but I think that through the right type of supply chains, those costs uh, will be absorbed. Great. Well, I, th I think that is very much the way it's going, you know, and I definitely with the come government that we've got, it seems to sort of suggest a new societal change that's pointing towards something that's more closely aligned with B Corp. But there is an interesting thing. Does it seem like an exclusive club for businesses that are all very good for the planet and people? Or is it an inclusive um, system where anybody can fill in the impact assessment, learn more about themselves? You know, what do you think, Brent? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not aware of, of any restrictions um, that B Corp put on on applicants. Um, I mean, obviously, if you're in the firearms game or or you're a you're a tobacco you're a tobacco manufacturer, then um, I don't think you're probably going to get certified. Um, uh, but 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 for, so so there are obviously certain categories which um, are in fundamental disalignment with with the B Corp mission. But beyond that, I think it's it's fair game for for any business in most sectors of, of any size. And, and again, you know, how much pain, you know, Steph's referred to the word pain in terms of, you know, filling out the the the, the B Lab application, which, you know, as someone who who has been involved in that, I can I can sort of I can testify, you know, it's um it's it's a labor of love. And it's about shepherding your internal stakeholders and your external stakeholders to to get the information you need and 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 where necessary change their their, their practices right which is, is what we're talking about here it's again more than a badge it's about not just what you talk but how you walk um so 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 yeah i think i think it's it's, it's definitely here to stay um and and i think we'll see more businesses from a more diverse varied range of categories and sectors um seek, seek seek certification and look you know from a consumer point of view this is one of the quite interesting angles to be corp is you know residents in our buildings in 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 built to rent in in, in multifamily and co-living and single family rentals they're seeing the b corp badge on that food box they get delivered on you know on on that pair of you know the box that the the new pair of trainers they bought came in on 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 you know the label of the clothes they buy that they're, they're seeing it everywhere now as as this gains traction and, and and that that will have you know a fundamental impact on on how they think about what goods and services to buy and of course inevitably where they live so so it's it's becoming it's becoming you know much more noticeable um, and much more prevalent in out there in the wild for everyone yeah, I think that taps into an interesting thing about the growth of the brand and what it's perceived as as well. You know, you go to a B social these days and you could end up talking to somebody from any category. It really is very diverse, but there is one common thread that pulls it all together. You know, the people have built in the impact assessment have similar values, you know, and I think that's the way it's pointing. Mm. So Brendan's back. Ah, I'm only back to so we're coming towards the end of the show, which has been a fascinating thing. So please carry on. I have a couple of questions myself, um, but um, if there's anything else on your side, um, Andy. Well, I think there's been a couple of questions come in through the um, the chat that I just want to make sure we've addressed. Somebody says, I'm sure if one of your companies has ISO 14,000, which focuses on an environmental management. Um, 
you know, how's how are the ISOs different, and do they help towards the um, towards the impact assessment and getting B Corp? I would say they do. Um, we've been ISO 14,001 14, um, for eight years now, I think. Um, but I think with regards to the kind of the internal policies and processes that we set up as a result of that definitely helped us in answering a lot of the the um, impact assessment. So I think that does help. Um, there are overlaps in certain things. So, for example, as part of that, we have like a, a suppliers list. So, we, you know, we keep um, records of our supply chain and um, th those sides of things. Uh, we have an environmental management system, which we put in place when um, we looked at the ISO certification. So I think there are definitely overlaps, um, but they they are different, obviously. There's, as I mentioned before, there's the kind of uh, the more um, American focus I think with regards to B Corp um, but I think that having both certifications is, is no bad thing oh, that's good um, I think ROI on going for B Corp Brent you've answered that fairly well um, BTR operators how do you ensure your suppliers follow your B Corp values I would say to that uh, it's not necessarily ensuring your suppliers follow your B Corp values. You choose your suppliers and you will choose suppliers basically on cost. But I think being B Corp certified means that you're also choosing suppliers based on who owns the business, where they're supplied. Do they have the right values? Are they heading in the right direction? Are they responsible? So you shape your own suppliers. And if brand or culture is not naturally inclined towards B Corp, what's the best way to break this down so a company can adjust to build it towards a B Corp behavior? I think fill in the impact assessment. It's broken into five separate parts. You'll get a feel for the kind of business that they're looking for by the kind of questions that are asked. It's free to uh, fill in the impact assessment. So you, and you can create as many accounts as you want as well. So just get in there and start looking at the questions and start thinking, is this where my business is going? Um, so I'll leave Andy, it at that. If you don't mind, I think that's might where I might have to just uh, bring things to a close of three minutes left to the end. I mean, this has been an amazingly candid, honest ex kind of discussion on what it takes to be a B Corp. I'm personally amazingly impressed at the leadership position that 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 this panel has taken, particularly, I think, Steph, with regard to a construction development entity, really, really looking to take this on. Um, it's it's really is commendable. Um, I know from my own supplier members, we have a supplier committee. I know they are deeply grum, um, um, unhappy that they try their very best to get a various accreditations. I'm not sure they've got B Corp, but they get accreditations and it counts for naught when it comes to tender. And this is a dynamic that as an industry built to rent needs to recognize exists and and start to address it. You know, the, 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 the baby steps perhaps to begin with, but, you know, it has to become um, an investor led initiative, I think, for it to be to really, really take hold. And if we look at the dynamics which are going on out there, your, your point on the consumer culture, um, Brent, and we're seeing B Corp on, on the smaller items that we're buying, we're seeing consumer culture greening and an expectation is rising from the from the ground upwards. And we're seeing the sort of capital markets slowly but surely through ESG and other regulations look, look greening as well as that comes down. And the construction sector or the development world is sort of sandwiched between these two. And 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 I think we those of us who have been in this industry for us for 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 any length of time and realize we've got some way to go on getting this right. But at least we're having the conversations and B Corp certainly shows us a way through. So I'd like to thank the panel. I'd like to thank Andy for putting this together. I, I think it's been a really, really fascinating and um um exposure. That's the only I can I can think of. So thank you very much to all of you for participating and sharing your journey with us. A couple of things from the uh, from the ARL as we just close off now. We we have our um, 
Manchester study tour next week. I think there's one or two spots left over. Don't forget our study tours are a year's worth of research done in a day. They really are high value um, um, opportunities to get under the bonnet of build to rent. And hopefully in time, we'll see a few B Corp buildings there too. And then the week after that, we have our uh, reverse trade show. And this is for, perhaps an opportunity for suppliers, for operators, even investors to speak with, with the industry more generally around business and with it, and 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 that's happening the week afterwards. There's places still available on that, and hopefully, B Corp can enter that conversation too, and we can start to see how we can draw some of these connections together. So, with 30 seconds left to go, I thank the panel again and wish you all a very good day. Cheerio. Thanks very thank much. You. So.